1977, a small factory in Colvin Leicester got to work on something that would change the lives of countless people. Little did they realise that people were still care enough 40 years later to sit and listen to a guy waffle on about that product. This is the Star Wars Toy Podcast. Hello there, and welcome to episode 38 of the Star Wars Toy Podcast, brought to you by Blue Harvest Vintage Toys. I'm your host, Darth Mark, and on this week's podcast, I'm going to be talking about one of the unsung heroes of the Star Wars toy world, and the vehicle he most famously created. But before that... The Star Wars Tracker Report. On this week's Tracker Report, I'm just going to start off with a message that Jared sent out over email on the Star Wars Tracker. It's not really something I want to talk about on this podcast. We're talking about toys, trying to get away from... As I've said before, I don't want to talk about politics, anything like that. This isn't politics. It's more more serious than that. But collecting can be a way of getting away from real life. As the world is coming to terms with the COVID-19 virus pandemic, you're no doubt getting lots of emails from various services explaining what they are doing in response to it. In order to some safe traffic in your inbox, I felt it unnecessary to send a specific message as Star Wars Chakra. It's entirely a digital service. As long as we are all of internet, it's business as usual here. That said, we are all expect, expected to spend more time at home, if at all possible. What that actually will look like will differ depending on where we actually live. In terms of our collecting hobby, some of us might actually see some positives in this. For example, when was the last time you actually had a good look through your collection? Maybe now is a good time to do a stock take and start documenting your collection with the portfolio functionality of the app. Maybe you can get organised to sell some pieces that you don't quite fit into your collection anymore, or conversely, make a list of things to hunt down. Lastly, the stay-at-home restrictions may start to have an isolating effect for some. However, there is a vibrant online vintage style community, and it's never been more accessible. If you feel like having some interaction with fellow collectors, then don't hesitate to get involved in these excellent Facebook groups, the Star Wars 12-back group, and the Imperial Commissary. There are many more groups to visit, but these are good friendly starting points. If you are new to the idea, until next time, stay safe and happy collecting, Jared. Yeah, like I mentioned uh, quite a few groups, Facebook groups, last week, and it's probably the best time at that <laughs> that I joined, to be honest with you. Maybe not so good on the wallet, but I've re-established contact with a few old friends. And quickly just going back to the things to hunt down. Listen to the end of the podcast where I'll be uh, mentioning a little something I'm going to be doing. Hopefully over the, over the weekend and maybe quite regular to help collectors find what they want. So the market activity for the 14th of March to the 20th March 2020. 710 items were sold with a total £48,477. So we're going to start off with the coins again. Number five is Luke Skywalker, original, for $45. Number four, Gamorrean Guard, $65. Number three, another Gamorrean Guard, for $79 this time. For number two, we have Han Solo Hoth, for $86. But number one, we have an Anakin Skywalker, for $260. So, on to the top five accessories. Number five, we have a turret and a probot. Kenner Empire Strikes Back A Hoth scene sold in the United States for $655. Number four, we have a Palatoy Death Star. Yes, Star Wars A Cardboard Spherical Playset sold in the United Kingdom for £585. Number three, Imperial Shuttle, another one of my uh, want list. That was a Kenner Return of the Jedi A Empire Arrival scene sold in the United States for $780. Number two, an Atat, and a Kenner Return of the Jedi A, Endor Forest scene, sold in the United States for $810. I did a uh, video this week over my YouTube channel about the Atat, about my uh, vintage Atat, so check that out. Uh, number one, we have a Millennium Falcon, on a Kenner Return of the Jedi A, Luke Jedi Tatooine scene, sold in the United States for $903. On to the top five loose figures. 
Number five, we have a pop-up lightsaber R2-D2, sold in the United States for $356. Number four, Luke Skywalker, Imperial Stormtrooper outfit, sold in Australia for $590. Number three, we have an AFA 75 squid head, a Lily Leddy version, sold in the United Kingdom for £310. Number two, we have a UK G85 yak face. Sold in Australia for 618 Australian dollars. For number one, we have another pop-up lightsaber R2-D2. This time sold for $389. So on to the top five mock figures now. Number five, R2-D2 droids on a Kenet Canada droids 12A card. Sold in the United States for $850. Number four, Boba Fett. On a Kenner Empire Strikes Back 48C. Sold in the United States for $960. Number three, Atto D2 pop up lightsaber again. On a Palatoy Return of the Jedi 70D card. Sold in Holland, Netherlands for £838. Number two, we have a Biker Scout, Lily Leddy Return of the Jedi 30A. Wow. Sold in the United States for $2,425. But at number one, we have another Lily Lady. Oh, those card backs are absolutely fantastic. And this is a 9 num on a Return of the Jedi 30B card. And this was sold in the United States for $2,511. So that was your Star Wars tracker for this week. Again, if you want to get that for yourself, as John has said, you've got plenty of time. You can uh, stock take your collection at the moment using the app. And you can value it. It'll do a self-valuation for you as well. So if you want that, head to www.starwarstracker.com. Okay, any for your thoughts? When the young kids on the street found out that I was working on Star Wars, I was like a god to them. Those kids are now parents. They've seen the movies throughout the years. There's always in the back of their mind, like, oh, wow, I remember playing with the Falcon. I remember playing with the X-Wing and the TIE Fighter. To understand that you have a small part of that kind of bigger world is, is pretty cool. My name is Mark Boudreau, and I've been fortunate enough to work on Star Wars toys since 1977. amazing thing about Star Wars, I don't think it's really ever gone away. It's always been there. Vehicles has been sort of what I really am the most passionate about. TIE Fighters, X-Wings, a raised speeder. I've always built models, built planes, cars. So they said, hey Mark, why don't you go ahead and start working on the Millennium Falcon? And I said like, sure, why not? Lane Falcon is more than just a machine. It really is a character that helps save the day. It's more than just a hunk of junk. He wanted to be able to provide an experience that could extend from the film. So when you went to go see the movie, you come right back and you're playing with Luke, you're playing with Han, you're playing with Chewie, and you're able to relive everything that you saw in the film. Long after I've gone to the forest, wherever that might be, this product will still be there. Grandkids from now will hopefully still be enjoying Star Wars. And we certainly want to try to do our small part into making sure that that continues. For over 40 years, some of the most iconic Star Wars action figures, vehicles, and toys have been designed by Mark Boudreau, senior principal designer for Hasbro Star Wars toys. But now Bedro is retiring from his job and paving the way for new designers to work in the Star Wars toy universe. It's certainly been a journey, one I'll never forget, a once in a lifetime opportunity for sure. Beyond working on the toys themselves, I would say that it's been all about working with the people and experiences along the way, Bedro told StarWars.com. I remember going to England and sitting in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon in Han Solo's seat, flipping levers and switches and imagining myself flying the Falcon. 
I also have the opportunity of sitting on the bridge of the invisible hand from Revenge of the Sith before it crashed of course and those things they can never be duplicated and I'm fortunately one of the few people who have had the opportunity to work so closely on this project for so many years. I don't see any end in sight for Star Wars and the love that fans have for the story. For a personal point of view I look forward to seeing whatever story goes beyond episode 9 or any story that goes beyond the Han Solo film. I think good content brings out the fans and I think that will continue to bring out the fan for generations to come. I really don't see any end in sight. So that's Mark Brudreau there, retiring after so many years. He created the original Millennium Falcon toy in 1978 and he's created them all since, as well as other Star Wars toys. And it's sad to see him go. And the vehicle he's more famous for creating is that Millennium Falcon. Starting in 1978, designing something that was a vehicle, but it was also a playset as well. So many features were built into that toy, and kids had so many hours of play value with that. Hours and indeed years, because it would survive everything, that Millennium Falcon. Because you see Millennium Falcons now, the vintage ones that uh, all the bits are missing off it, but uh, the shell is in one piece and it's built to last just like the real Millennium Falcon. Han and Chewie could sit in the cockpit. There was a degeneric table where the passengers could play while they're going through hyperspace. The gunner seat for Luke to sit in and the quad guns that uh, clicked when they moved round. It had its secret cargo hold where that piece had come off. And in fact, you could actually slide that piece into the top part of the engine of the Millennium Falcon. There are actually a couple of little clips, so you don't lose that piece. It should really have had clips for that Jedi training ball, because that is always missing. The ramp open up, opens up, and the two struts can be hard to find, and you have to be careful with the ramp, because there's a little clip, and if that's broken off, it won't fit on. It won't stay on at all. And as this was actually a vehicle, it did have landing gear, and the bigger middle strut, strut was uh, like a handle where you held on while you flew it about and you got chased by your French TIE fighters. Now, this Millennium Falcon had one last feature and it was battery operated and it was a sound. Uh, <laughs> don't get too excited. It was a very, very annoying screeching sound. I think it was meant to be like a battle alarm or something like that. I don't know where they got that from but it was kind of the same alarm that uh, or sound that you got from the Kenner X-Wing all it was was a little motor uh, again that was the same from the X-Wing uh, and it had a little plastic clip that rotated against some grooves and made this awful sound and I think the TIE Fighter had the same kind of thing too but this toy is probably the most iconic toy in toy history not just Star Wars this is the most iconic type. If, if you see a, a 70s, 80s programme, there's always a Millennium Falcon in it. Yes, you have Castle Grayskull and you have USS Flag, but how many people had USS Flag compared to having this Millennium Falcon? So this was played with, passed around, passed down to younger siblings, sold on market stalls, sold on car boats, until 1995 when we got another version. It was the same mould. It was produced by Tonka, who was kind of Kenner, Kenner Tonka back then. And then Hasbro. It had all the same features. It was the same size. Say, as I say, same mould, but it had lights and sound, uh, proper sounds this time. <laughs> it had engine sounds and uh, laser sounds. And it had two little lights at the front that uh, was quite baffling, really, where you, you had your quad guns that was the laser guns. Yes, you had your proton torpedoes, but uh, they weren't proton torpedoes. They were uh, laser, laser sounds, laser cannon sounds, and little red lights at the front. So that's something to be careful about if you're uh, looking for a vintage one. Sometimes you might get mistaken and get... Not it's not as modern now. It's the modern version, what we call the modern version. It's not modern, obviously. It's nineteen ninety five, but uh, it is the moderner version than the vintage, if that makes any sense. 
But if you're after a cheaper generic Millennium Falcon, that's probably the one for you. But me, I prefer the vintage. You could probably get it at the same price, to be honest with you. Uh, not Probably not boxed, but uh, loose on eBay. The next Falcon I'm going to mention is the 2005 Big Hasbro Millennium Falcon. Now, when I say big, this is absolutely massive. They had this thing back then where everything had to be big. They brought re, uh, re-released the Attack, uh, had extra loads of different features into it. But this Millennium Falcon is a better scaled version. And again, it had so many bits in it. To find one of those complete these days is practically impossible. I think it has six missiles, a separate escape pod, quad guns on the top and the bottom, and even the figures for the generic table, Han and Chewie, which actually got with the Falcon, sat nicely in the cockpit. They had movable chairs so Chewie could sit down comfortably. They had more panels cut out, so you could have a bigger playset this time. Doors actually opened into other corridors. And of course, the secret cargo hold. And this had something that the other two didn't have. Awesome special effects, sound effects, phrases from all the characters in the Star Wars film, and amazing lights. I think this retailed for about £150 when it first came out, but uh, you'd be lucky to get one for 400 now, complete. It is amazing. It is the best Millennium Falcon that has come out from Hasbro or Kenner. But I still prefer the vintage because it's the original. There have been, of course, Millennium Falcons come out from The Force Awakens solo. Um, but I'm not going to go mention them because they're not very good at all. And the one with the Nerf gun inside it, what the hell was going on there? I've also had model versions, Airfix, the big one, and the one that came with the Echo Base model set. That was absolutely brilliant, that. Uh, the diecast version there's also the micro collection one which i've never actually seen i've not actually seen any of the micro collection i would love some of that but apparently that millennium falcon is sought after everywhere you of course have your lego versions that 750 50 pound one that actually had wheels in the box so you could lift it and it kind of made the one before it obsolete the one that the people were trying to sell for a thousand pound on ebay so good on your Lego. And of course, there's the Degasini Partwork Millennium Falcon that I, I had, I built. It took me two years to build it. Um, I painted it, did it up and everything like that. I was going to build a table around it, but uh, I've sold it. I got a lot less for it than I actually paid. But it passed some time. It uh, kept me happy for a while. I had to just clear it out with a lot of space and it had to go, basically. It was the studio scale model and it was quite big. It was about the same size as the Lego version, very detailed and it even had a little remote control for the lights and the ramp. But I'm doing the same for the X-Wing now, well, if I can find it and you can watch me build it over on my YouTube channel. So until the Black Series Millennium Falcon comes out, <laughs> imagine the size of that, we can be safe in the knowledge that our vintage Millennium Falcons will never break. Somebody once told me the world is gonna grow me. I ain't the shark. This girl in the shed. So I got some more feedback this week from Paco Allen, who emailed me. Hi Mark, just wanted to drop you a quick line as you've called out for feedback a few times on the show. I've collected various Star Wars lines throughout my life, but only have about 20 of my original vintage figures, all in pretty rough shape. In the past 10 years or so, I started collecting the Black Series and Hot Toys, but recently started working on rebuilding my vintage Lowe's collection. After picking up a few figures, I found your podcast, and it's been extremely helpful in educating me about the toy lines and the marketplace. I picked up the Star Wars tracker, which, as you said many times, is invaluable. And if you're serious about collecting these figures and not overpaying or being ripped off with repro accessories. I have the original 20 from Star Wars, all in really good condition. I'm missing Obi-Wan's lightsaber and picked up a layer with a repro weapon before subscribing to your podcast and learning the lesson of buy complete. I'm 22 figures into the Empire line 
or complete with ac original accessories and in excellent or better condition. I've picked up a few at local shops, Time Tunnel Toys in San Jose, California, for all the locals, but most of my collection has come from eBay. I recently joined some of the Facebook groups you recommended, but I honestly found better deals on eBay. It does require a lot of work though. I have dozens of safe searches, multiple auctions, and I'm monitoring every day. Time is going off at all hours to ensure I check in and during the last few minutes of all the auctions, etc. But if you want to stay on top, I found eBay as the largest volume and best chance to snag a good deal. I'm not looking forward to get any of, any of the Jedi line, which has a bunch of figures I don't really care about, and that are the most expensive toys in the line. I might have to get selective there, but not having the complete line will drive me crazy. Anyway, thanks for the show and all the information and entertainment. Happy collecting, and may the force be with you. So thanks for the email, Paco. It's a uh, real encouraging cheer that you are listening, and that have helped you, basically. That's that's the reason for doing this. I'm a collector first and foremost. I want to keep this hobby alive for the next generation. I hope you've got rid of that repro layer weapon. And if you were listening a couple of weeks ago, which sounds like you have, the Jedi, Jedi line is definitely not the most attractive. And most of them have sticks instead of blasters. The Jedi figures themselves are really expensive. They were mostly mass-produced. But it's the last 17 that's uh, more, more sought after, meaning higher price. I will be talking about the Power of the Force and the last 17 and the coins in coming weeks. So again, thanks for the kind words and I hope you achieve the full 96. If you need any help getting any certain figures, let me know. Um, what I'm going to be doing is live streaming regularly over YouTube to help collectors get what they need and maybe value some of the toys. It's all a matter of being patient, enjoying what you do and not to overspend. So yeah, what I'm going to try and do is get onto YouTube maybe once, twice a week, uh, do a little bit of a live stream, talk about latest trends and things like that, and value people's collections, people's toys, not just Star Wars, any toys really. I'll also be talking about what, I, what I'm after, and I want requests on what people want. I want to find people things. I've always liked completing people's collections. I always said that when I was in the shop. It's one of the reasons why I opened it and why I founded Blue Harvest. I wanted to get a really good reputation for customer service. I want to get more people in this hobby, not just Star Wars, in collecting in general. Get, people need a hobby, and this is a perfect hobby for people. You don't have to spend a lot of money. Buy Funkos, buy Lego, buy something that's in your budget. So I'm going to be starting live streaming over on YouTube every week, probably more at this point in time. And what I've been thinking about doing, I've been thinking a while uh, about how I thinking more podcast-wise than doing a daily podcast, but why don't I do a daily YouTube live stream on Star Wars Toy News? So I can free this podcast up for more vintage stuff. Granted, there's not a lot of Star Wars Toy News about at the moment, but with the upcoming Black Series um, retro collection, 40th anniversary stuff. I'm sure there'll be plenty to talk about, even if it's just like a five minute live stream or video. I'm trying to get a lot more subscribers over to YouTube. I uh, post videos nearly every day now and I've had a bit of a revamp. Somebody said that it looked like a shop. Well, there was videos of my shop in there, but I was told that uh, it may have put people off thinking it was a shop and I was trying to sell them something. So yeah, I would like to get as many subscribers as I can. And maybe to do this, maybe not as a living, but get a little bit of money out of it. It's not a non-profit organisation, is Blue Harvest. But it is at the moment, but I hope it won't be in the future. So that said, Sunday, 6 o'clock, over on YouTube, search for Blue Harvest Vintage Toys. Or just click the link in the show notes. Get over there, subscribe. Click the bell so we, uh, you know when I go live. And this weekend, I will be giving away the Empire Strikes Back DVD. The original version and the uh, special version. And there's two discs in there. And that will be to the person that asked me the best question. So get your thinking caps on.
So as I said, there's not a lot of news about at the moment. There are a few sporadic limited edition Black Series coming out, but no new waves. You can pre-order a few of the Black Series 40th Empire Strikes Back figures over on Amazon, including the Snow Speeder and the Probe Droid. But one nice piece of news came out yesterday. Life Size The Child announced by Hot Toys. The Mandalorian Season 1 might have ended, but that's not stopping fans from obsessing over the child. Also known as Baby Yoda, this new adorable pal is sweeping the nation and now Hot Toys is also bringing him to life. This life-size collectible is really something else and super realistic detail with a wide variety of interchangeable parts. That's right, unlike the ones out there, the child will come with swappable hands and ears to give fans a truly customisable experience. It will also come with a silver knob from the Razor Crest and a Mythosaur emblem necklace. This is the Mandalorian collectible fans have been waiting for and will be a must-have for any Star Wars fans. Pre-orders and prices are not live yet, but keep tuned. Uh, we'll let you know as soon as they are. I reckon about £300, £200-£300 for this. Protect the bounty at all costs. So there you go, that's another Star Wars toy podcast in the books. Please do send me some feedback on this podcast. I really like to hear what you think about this podcast and about your collections. And again, if there's any way that can help you out. The way you can help me out is if you like, share, subscribe, especially to my YouTube channel, because this podcast goes out there too as well as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, all the good podcatchers, and some of the bad ones too. Check out my Tee Public store. Some of the uh, artwork for this podcast are up there. And also, check out my Patreon. That would really help the podcast and the channel, and Blue Harvest as a whole. Also, if you've got any uh, thoughts, uh, you want to come on the podcast, you want to send an audio clip, you can email me, blueharvesttoys at gmail.com and send me a message over on Twitter, at Star Wars Toy Pod. But until next week, I know you can't get out there, I know you can't go collecting, but have a look online, have a look on eBay, have a look on Facebook, but as always, be patient with your collection, enjoy what you're doing, and don't break the bank. But as always, May the toys be with you. Just one more round, friend. Then a homeward bound, friend. Don't forget me in your dreams. Just one more song, friend. And then so long, friend. The nights get shorter, it seems. Just one more round. Friend, yes, it's a crime, friend. But you know, time, friend, time can fly. So it's good night, friend. Good night, but not goodbye.